Hello and welcome to Tata Literature Live, the 11th annual Mumbai International Lit Fest, the first one to be completely digital, co-sponsored by Tata Steel and Tata Projects. We will be having a Q&A at the end of the session, so please do send in your questions in the comment section of the platform that you are viewing from. British author Howard Jacobson's books, among other themes, often revolve around the Jewish sentiment and tend to flesh out diverse Jewish characters. His two non-fiction books, Roots, Shoots, Journeys Among Jews, and Seriously Funny, From the Ridiculous to the Sublime, inspired related television series. His trademark weight and style has been reflected in his latest book, Living a Little, Live a Little which is about finding love in the grey wonder years of life, reminding us that love has no timeline. Mr. Jacobson will be in conversation with publisher Kartika VK, who has published several award-winning authors including Arvind Adiga, Anita Nair, Manu Joseph, Raghu Karnad, to name a few. Over to our speakers. Thanks, Jillian. Um, Mr. Jacobson, am I audible to you? You are. Okay. It's a great pleasure to be with you here at this session. It's, um, it's nearly the end of the year, and as a publisher and an editor, I think I've just spent the last three months copy editing, editing and editing, and primary editing manuscripts, and then this was upon me, so I just spent the last week putting everything else aside and just diving into your books, your nonfiction, your fiction. And it's been such a delight. It's been about literally shutting myself in a room and saying, do not get in my face because I'm going to just laugh and I don't want anyone watching me as I crack up. And it's actually been the publishing part of it, as you may well guess, with anyone who's interested in publishing. It's Zoom time that really had me laughing because that's my world. It's all about dying fiction, it's all about publishers killing themselves out of, well, all kinds of issues. And uh, at this time, then, to chance upon something as beautiful as Live a Little also came as a bit of a surprise to me, I think, uh, because it's all so sunshine and autumn and old age, uh, and yet the same ideas and many of the themes that you have discussed and explored in so many ways in other books, uh, love, relationships, man-woman, Jewishness, Londonness, Britishness, all of these beautiful things. So I want to start by not talking about the new novel yet, but I want to take you to that one line which has stayed with me through these days, which is from a column in The Independent where you said, as long as women are laughing, there's civilization. Tell us about laughter. Tell us about women and laughter and what your idea of civilization is. Okay. Well, can I just say to begin with how lovely it is to be here, to be back in India. I was in India at the beginning of this year, not knowing I was going to be locked away in London. So it's lovely to be back. I feel as if I'm well, I was in Singapore and now I'm in Mumbai, which I've not been able to... To, this is a festival I've not been able to come to for many years, so it's one advantage of what's happened that I'm able to be here. So thank you. And thank you for your words. I like the idea that you've been locked away with me for a week. I hope I was, I hope I was uh, respectable. You and, entertaining. I hope so. Good. Um, well, that line, yes, laughter. Laughter seems to have been... I'm full of theories about laughter, and I've written a book about laughter, and I've made a television series about laughter, and I can be more boring about laughter. I can be least amusing about, less amusing about comedy than anybody on earth, so I have to, I have to watch that. But I think, it be, I think writing and comedy began together for me when, as a little shy boy, I discovered that I could make my mother's women friends laugh. When I made them laugh, I felt I was somebody. I felt I'd come out of the obscurity of being a little boy that was frightened and nervous and timorous and suddenly I could say something and women laughed. And it was sort of exciting in a kind of way, if you can be excited in that way aged five or six. 
Please, I thought my mother's friends were all very beautiful women, so to make them laugh was doubly, doubly entrancing for me. And from there on in, I think, I thought the whole business of talking, writing, thinking, communicating to everybody, but particularly, particularly to women, because women were my first audience. That was what got me going as a writer. And it's important for me to say that women were, were my first audience because, because they, they truly were. were. I was brought up by my mother, who was young. I was the first child. My grandmother and my mother's sister. Three, Three women who thought, thought I was fantastic because they'd never had a little child in the family before, before and, they clapped, and they, clapped they clapped everything I did, everything I did and, they and they laughed at everything, everything that I said. And my whole life has been an attempt to get those three women or get all women, the, all the women in the world, to laugh, to laugh at me as those first three women did. So I can't separate making women laugh, making anybody laugh, being funny from writing. It's the same thing for me. So that as a reader, I like to laugh. My favourite experiences as a reader too are laughing. So for me, Charles Dickens or, or Jane Austen, the writers who make me laugh are my, are my most favourite writers. And, and laughter is a very complicated thing and a very, it can be a very intellectual act to laugh. Because to laugh, you have to get a joke. And a lot of people don't get the joke. They don't know where the joke is. They've not comprehended the joke. So laughter is an act of comprehension, too. It's very important. Right. But has the nature of that joke changed, you think, with time? What was a joke is no longer a joke and what is now a joke? Is, I mean, at some point, I think you talked about stand-up comedy and how the idea of the comic and the idea of performing the comic has changed. I don't really remember where I read this, but I, I think you mentioned this somewhere. So has that idea of what's funny changed for you as a consumer of that uh, laughter as well as someone who makes that laughter possible? I don't know whether it's changed for me. It's changed for the world. There is no question that what made people laugh 30 years ago or even five years ago or even two years ago is not what makes them laugh now. I find this disturbing. I am anxious. I'm finding I'm having to check um, the things I want to say that I think are funny because I'm so conscious now that the world is not finding things funny as it once did. For good reason, I don't deny it. There are very good reasons why we are all having to think twice before we say the things that we used to say. But the downside of that is that we are all censoring one another and also censoring ourselves. I am conscious now that I have to censor myself when I write. Sometimes that's a good thing because I'm glad I've thought twice about something that wasn't either wise or intelligent or funny. But it also means there is a break upon the flow of vivacity, that one can't let oneself go into, into the world of comedy anymore. I just wonder what someone like Dickens would do. Dickens who just took comedy into everywhere, every sphere of life, how he would manage now in a much more censorious world. I don't like our censorious world. I think it's quite difficult for and dangerous to writers at the moment. Is it, any, is it different for writers as it, than it is for, say, someone standing on stage or on television every night cracking jokes about politics? Uh, do you think the writer has a greater responsibility of some sort to stay clear of things that might offend or hurt or get on the wrong side of people? Or is it the same, really? I think we all, I think anybody who's in the comedy business or the thinking or the speaking business has a duty to not worry too much. We can't avoid it, I've just said that. But to worry about whether we cause offence is a terrible inhibition. I, can, I, I think a comedian has got a right to say what he thinks is funny. If the audience don't like it, they can throw tomatoes at him. If the audience doesn't, if my <laughs> readers don't like what I say in my books, they can close the book, they can tear the book, they can throw the book at me. The advantage a comedian has is if his audience doesn't like what he's doing, he can turn on his audience and attack them. If I'm reviewed somewhere or other by somebody with no sense of humor, as I would see it, and doesn't find what I say fun, I can't do anything. 
I feel quite homeless. I want to be able to, you know, I want to, I wish then that I were on the stage and this were a person heckling me from the front so I could deal with this person. So I could explain why that person has, you know, when we say we don't get a joke or we don't find something funny, we sometimes think we're saying something final about the jokester or the book or the comic material. But we might be saying something about ourselves. Not to get a joke is not always the joke's fault. Sometimes not to get a mm. joke is our fault. We might lack the warmth to get a joke. We might lack the generosity of spirit to get the joke or the intelligence to get a joke. So it's a two way street. But if you're writing, you have no you have no comeback. You have no recourse. You have to you have to suffer. You have to suffer in silence. I'm not looking for pity. Well, I am looking for pity, but I shouldn't be looking for pity. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to say it is a terrible anguished thing to be a writer. But there are times when you would like to be able to strike back. Right. So can I take you back a little bit more to something that interests me personally, which is your early um, university days. You were taught by F.R. Davis. I read somewhere a reference to Raymond Williams. Uh, these were all people we grew up reading the literary theory of and understanding how to read fiction and literature of. What was it like to have them as people who you learned from? Well, what I was, they like? What were those you university days like? My university days were awful because I made them awful because I, I went to Cambridge. I went to study under F.R. Leavis and I was one of a small band of people who were taught by Leavis. So three days a week we would troop into Leavis's room um, and be as, you know, very, very close to F.R. Leavis. And we, I took him very seriously. I thought he was fantastic. I thought he was funny. I keep meaning to write a book about the, the comedy of F.R. Lewis because he was funny, he was witty, he was amusing, he was wry. Um, I loved him actually and I still do. I revere him. Um, we live in a world now in which not many people know who Lewis is. But when I was a student, which is in the 60s, Lewis was the hottest thing in, in literary, yeah. insofar as anything in literary criticism can be said to be hot, Lewis was hot. And I was close to him and I listened to every word he said. And I probably was influenced maybe a little bit too much by him. I'd, I'm not a person who has heroes. I've never heroized anybody, really. Um, I feel too proud. Uh, people can heroize me, but I'm not going to heroize anybody else. <laughs> but I did heroize Lewis, and I still do. I thought he was a wonderful reader. He helped teach me how to read. Um, he introduced me to... More poetry, actually, than novels. I, I thought I could go my own way with novels, but poetry, the poetry of Thomas Hardy, he was wonderful about the poetry of Keats, poetry of Wordsworth, he was wonderful about Wordsworth. The poems of um, Hardy, did I mention that? It was terrific as a teacher, and I loved him. But that was the only part of being at university I liked. For some reason, I made a very bad job of being a student. I just couldn't do it. I was still that shy boy, that only that was only alive when I could entertain my mother's friends. And the trouble was when I went to Cambridge, my mother's friends weren't there. And nobody that reminded <laughs> me of my mother's friends were there. I had no one to make laugh at Cambridge, really. So I was a sulky, morose, depressed, awkward looking, gauche, horrible boy, really, just horrible and miserable all the time. <laughs> at least I had Lewis for three hours a week to look forward to. For me, Cambridge was Lewis. And I only really ever became a, a student, a proper student, when I became a teacher, because I no sooner left university than, with a good reference from Levis, I went to teach at Sydney University in Australia. So there I was, age yeah. 21, just 22, teaching at Sydney University, and there I became, a, there I had a nice university life. There indeed were women who reminded me of my mother's friends and and men that I was able to get on easily with. Most of my friends at Cambridge had been awkward, like me. Short is we were all similar. Grammar, northern working class grammar school boys who gravitated to Levis and Raymond Williams for obvious reasons. And the fact that we were all like that meant that we got no relief from one another. So when I got to Australia, I felt I was like a flower. The sun shone, people laughed, I came alive. That's beautiful. And was that very, very different from Manchester and your earlier still uh, childhood growing up in that yes. part of England? 
Uh, yes, everything everything was different from Manchester. I'm, I'm had curious to... because you. Sorry, am I interrupting? No, don't, Please go on. You go on. No, I I was just curious because I read you um, on cricket. I read you about cyclists and sports of all other kinds, but Manchester and no football. Uh, so what's with that? Were you always very different from the other kids around you, or I just, didn't just like that, there was all of that to share? I didn't like football. I didn't like playing football. I didn't like being hit by the ball. I didn't like, I mean, it was always cold and wet in Manchester. And I didn't like having to put on a pair of shorts and run around in the cold and in muddy fields. I, didn't, I couldn't see the pleasure in that. And, that, and right. that spread to the game itself. So I never really enjoyed it. I did like, though, I did like watching cricket. And I remained um, a fan of cricket. In fact, one of the things that's got me through this summer locked away in London is sitting in front of the television watching the IPL and watching those terrific right. players play. So cricket is another thing for me. Cricket is, um, cricket, yes, but football, no. And I was not I was a sportsman of a sort. I played table tennis. Oh, but yeah. I liked that. Okay. But I played it very seriously. I wasn't, you know, just mm. somebody I played ping pong. I played table tennis. And I played it right. seriously. And I played for Lancashire. And I very nearly played for England. I wasn't quite good enough, but I was near... I was a ranked player in the country. So I took that very, very seriously. And I loved that because I didn't have to run around in cold fields. It was inside. It was a lovely inside game. And it suited my right. personality. Because in a way, there's, there's a connection between table tennis players and levy sites. There's something about an introversion. It's a very introverted game, table tennis. You, get, you don't have to look at anybody else. You concentrate on this narrow area. I'm not saying that a table tennis table was like a poem by Thomas Hardy but there was some similarity it suited me anyway but that's the beginning and the end of sport for me I watched cricket and I played table tennis right okay um a lot of what I found in the new novel I should have said uh, and I wrote a novel about table tennis excuse me I should have yeah. said I forget, I forget to publicize to... myself I wrote a novel yeah. about table tennis called The Mighty Waltzer um which some people think is my best novel because people who've done strange things, obsessive things, recognize themselves, even if they didn't play table tennis, they recognize themselves in the obsessiveness. Because table tennis, a sport that nobody watches, is, it becomes a very obsessive thing because you end up doing it for yourself and you have the wildest dreams. So I dreamed I would become world champion. Truly, I dreamed as a player, and then I give it to my hero in this novel to have the same dream of becoming a world world champion, the most famous table tennis player in the world uh, who made millions of pounds, which you don't make, however good you are at table tennis, <laughs> and who enjoyed the adulation of beautiful women. And of course, the sad irony is um, you neither make any money nor enjoy the adulation of anybody if you're a table tennis player. Okay, yeah. <laughs> that's true. Mm. No, so um, I am conscious of the fact that I'd like to talk to you forever, but they'll start pointing signs at us, and we must talk about the new novel uh, with some focus, if we may. Uh, so can I ask you to tell us, is this a sort of natural trajectory, getting to talking and writing about people of a certain age? At an, are you having intimations of mortality that make this an important part of your own thinking, of your own emotional experience at this time. What makes a novel like that? It's entirely full of hope. I felt as though I'd entered a world where anything was possible. How is a 99-year-old and a 91-year-old uh, coming, the coming together of this couple in that world which is full of widows and um, uh, literally sun sort of going down on their lives? How did you manage to make this something about the good things of life and not the end of things? Well, I don't really know because my own natural in instinct is to be gloomy. I mean, I've never really been a young person, as you can hear from my description of sports and going to university. Mm -hmm. I skipped being young. It just never happened. So I came into the world sort of old and I remained old so you would have thought that when I actually truly got to be old anything I wrote about age would be depressing strangely enough the the reverse happened 
But I don't know how much that has got to do with my nature or my skills as a novelist, as the fact that I've been very lucky in meeting in the last few years, and just before writing this novel, meeting a number of people quite old who were full of life. My mother died only a few months ago. She was 97. She was a very, very lively, funny, clever woman until the end. My mother-in-law lived till she was 106. And certainly until she was 103, she was full of vitality and charm and beauty and warmth. I recently met a, a very famous um, a, a journalist who was very famous in the 1950s and 60s in this, in this country, a man called Donald Zeck, um, who introduced himself to me only about 10 years ago when he was nearly 90. I've known him. He's now 101. Um, He's the cleverest person I know. I send him my manuscripts to see what he thinks of things. We exchange, He sends me poems. When his, his wife died just before his 90th birthday, and he decided he would learn, she was a pianist, and he would learn all the music that she played. So he taught himself Bach. That's Mozart. like the character in the Finkler question, right? Oh, aren't you clever? That's exactly who he is. You're oh, clever. Is That's who he is. I, oh. I, I actually put him in the Finkler question, and, and I said, do you mind, I don't normally do this, and I said, do you mind if I just use you? Because oh. he told me such wonderful stories of what it was like, for example, when his friends arranged for him to have a blind date when he was 90, oh. to have a blind date with a 30-year-old woman. He couldn't hear a word she was saying. She'd say things like, what's your favourite colour? And he'd say, Mozart. And, <laughs> and he'd tell me this story, and I'd write it down, and I said, can I just put this in the book? And I won, I, won the, the, I won the Booker Prize with the Finkler question. And I've often yes. said to him, my friend Donald, it's your, that prize is yours, really. Because I won the Booker Prize for your, you in that novel is what people love most. And I, he's still alive. I go on talking to him. He's a painter. He won a painting prize when he was 90. He never painted before. So he paints. He makes music. He writes poems. He writes to me. He had his 100th birthday, whatever it was, 18 months ago or something, and he sat slumped in his chair, and we all thought, oh, poor Donald. Does, and he'd said, I don't want to say anything. And we thought, poor old Donald is past it. And then he just kind of opened up. He just threw, as though in the way in which a person throws back a coat or a, or a hood, he threw the hood of old age off himself and just addressed a whole room of people who loved him with the most extraordinary eloquence. And, the, and I've been lucky to meet several people like this, which has made me think, old people are not, old people are, not only are old people not finished, they're actually cleverer than, they're actually better company than people a quarter, the, a quarter their age, let alone half their age. So I think, I think it's, it's not about my gifts of warmth, though I like to think that I have some, as much as serendipity. I've been, I've been, it's a very serendipitous book, Live a Little. I had no model, for example, for, for Beryl, the 90-odd-year-old 90 year, old, 90 odd year old woman in this novel, um, who many people have been kind enough to say um, might be the best character I've ever written. And I think she's the best character I've ever written. I didn't write her, though. I feel a cheat. I didn't write her. She wrote herself. She just appeared. One shouldn't, be, one shouldn't be mystical as a writer, but occasionally writing, like painting, like music make, making, is a kind of mysterious thing. You don't know where stuff comes from. And it might have been that Beryl just appeared out of whatever, the, the, the atmosphere, my own atmosphere of ageing, the people I'd been meeting. But she just appeared. I knew who she was. I knew how she talked. I knew why she was alive. This is not a, this is not a novel. I'm not a social concern novel. So this isn't a novel about why we must be nice to our grannies. Uh, <laughs> it's not and, and worry about care. Yeah. Not that there'd be anything wrong with that, but that's not my kind of thing. But that just seemed to me that this is... This character appeared, she had so much to say for herself, she had so much charm, her, and a kind of strange erotic quality, though this isn't an erotic novel in that sense, but there was something enticing about her conversation. So it became, for me, as a challenge, um, a novel about conversation. Never mind all the other yeah. stuff about, about falling in love. You know, which I've written about and everybody's written about. I thought the joy of this, since she came to me as a gift from the gods, and since a number of these older people, amongst whom I must now number myself, are those in those whose company I I keep, I must honour what it is that they do best, and what they do best is that they talk. 
So this is a story of falling in, live a little is falling in love through conversation. A challenge for me as a writer. And if you enjoyed it and felt it was sunny, then I rose to that challenge was to make them fall in love through words and conversation and for the reader to believe it. Yes, those are conversations in which if you were party to that conversation, you would fall in love with the other, with the person you're talking to. Yeah. And I love the way you actually weave words into the plot itself. I mean, she's struggling with finding the right words all the time. And she comes up with the most beautiful words, which I had to go look up the meaning of once in a while to see what she meant and writing the journal. So it also became a book about uh, writing, about words, about naming. Uh, I mean, her name, I can't pronounce it. Would you please say it for me? Princess. Ducenberry. Ducenberry. No, the, the princess. princess. Oh, the princess. Something. Sorry. Yes. Well, she calls herself the Princess Scheherazade. The, pin the princess, there was an advertisement on English television for Schweppes, Schweppes drinks. And That's she called right, herself, yeah. Can't even remember now, Schweppes yeah. Lucasade or Schweppes, the Princess Schweppes. But she loves that sound because it sounds Schweppes. Central European to it. So she makes, mm -hmm. uh, sh and then she remembers the various <laughs> people who have sh names, like the Princess Shabatsky, who is a character in Tolstoy. So she loved, she's a, she's a literary woman, she was a teacher. So she loves raiding literature for her references, which means, yeah. which, which I do too, it, it meant that I liked writing about her. And she loves words, which makes it tragic that she's losing them, but also mm. a source of comedy in that, because she's losing them, she has to find somebody, something else. So her, her loss of, this is not often how we think about loss of memory and dementia and things like that. But in a way, it's an opportunity for a little while anyway. It's an opportunity to invent. So it kind of, the losses that she suffers um, make, her, make her inventive. They make somebody creative out, out, out of her. Right, yeah. Yeah, I think that inventiveness is really what catches us because you... I was deceived into thinking that this was going to uh, go into even more depressing territory because she's going to lose her mind or she's going to lose her words, you know, in a graver fashion. Instead, she starts climbing a ladder towards other things which yes. are yeah. younger interests, which are things that you imagine younger women are involved with and younger men. And I also loved the uh, detail of what makes someone attractive to someone of that age. I mean, the fact that he can he does not spill his tea, that his fingers hold the cup together, that he can zip himself up without help. <laughs> that, and you're thinking, yeah, these are really achievements to be celebrated at a certain age. And yeah. why has it yeah. taken me so long to read a novel about this? Because I really haven't. Is there a problem with us that we don't write and read enough novels about older people? Or is it's it just that idea. older people don't write about themselves? I think older people don't write about themselves or they... Uh, uh, I think there is a feeling that it's not a hot subject. There yeah. is a feeling that it's the old aren't sexy. And while it wasn't my object to save the old in that way, I did feel, so I'm not a campaigning, crusading novelist. As I went on writing this, I thought more and more, yes, people should be writing about that. These people have got experience. This, and if you like, I like writing about what's in people's heads rather than what they do. So if you've got two old people talking to one another, you haven't got detectives, you haven't got a mystery, you haven't got a thriller. You've got, you've got to like talk and you've got to like as a writer the idea that, you know, I've often thought, you know, the best novels, what do I most like in novels? What do I most like in Jane Austen? Talk. What do I most like in Henry James? Conversation. And yeah. if you like conversation, if you enjoy conversation, if conversation is the, the best thing that we do, and I think it's the best thing that we do, I'd rather talk to my wife or to my friends than do anything else, well, apart from eat and drink. But I'd rather <laughs> talk to my wife when I'm eating and drinking than do anything else on earth. And if that's the case, then as a writer, I should honor that. And I don't care about anything. Let nothing else happen. Let them just talk. And when my publishers first read this, they kind of, I could see them wor worrying, shouldn't, shouldn't more stuff be happening? But they did agree they were engrossed. They were engrossed. Right. In, fact, in fact, for a little while, it was going to go on much longer than that. And then I thought, I have to stop this. Because, not because I'm wonderfully inventive about the conversation, but I think I'm good at it because I like it. But because they, once they set themselves in motion, these two characters, they just couldn't, 
There was no reason for them ever to stop talking to each other, ever, until right. they died. I didn't want to talk about that. No, I, I know that as an editor, the thing that I struggle with a lot in fiction when we get manuscripts is the register of that conversation and how often writers don't manage to make it work in terms of both character and situation and just provide us with a sense of liveliness that keeps the reader engaged and participating in that conversation rather than listening from the outside. And that I thought was marvelous about this book, that I just went like ping pong or table tennis, not ping pong, but I was just like <laughs> head turning this way, head turning that way, listening to their repartee, right. their conversations. It was really, it was really the most fun old person's uh, community you've given us here. And I just hope you will continue to write about older people a lot more. There's very little left. And you make I'm that point no across. across. <laughs> Sorry, what was that? I have no choice, I'm afraid. <laughs> I think old age is going no, but to is that little boy, that shy little boy in the book also partly you? You talked about growing up and being awkward and and the old gentleman in this book also has a childhood that is pretty traumatic for yes, reasons we shall not bit, give away to the reader. There's a tiny bit of there is a tiny bit of me in that. But it isn't it isn't me, but there is a tiny bit, yes. And is there a tiny bit of you in every novel you've written? I'm a bit that kind of a writer, yes. I'm afraid there is. I, I spill in. I don't want to write about me, but I kind of, I suppose I have been, because of the kind of background I had and the person I was, I am something of a solipsist and self-engrossed, as, as you can hear, as you can see. So I'm not very good at keeping myself out, but I try to keep myself out because I think it's, it, there shouldn't be too much of you. I feel there's too much of me now. Is there too much of me now? Now. No. 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 Hold on. I think we just saw that they're going to start question answers right now. So I've lost okay. my chance to ask you anymore. And we're going to have to hand over to Gillian for other people to ask questions. But Gillian, I want to say right at the end, I do have one question I'm dying to ask him and I want to ask him. Oh. <laughs> so allow me later. Okay, I will. Thank you very much for your questions. Thank you. Chilean over to you. Absolutely, Karthika. I mean, I've been so engaged during this entire conversation, I didn't want it to stop. But we have some <laughs> eager audience members who have a lineup of questions. So I'm going to start now to allow you enough time to right. sum up. Okay, so our first question is from Usha Subramanian. How culture-specific is humor? Say that again. How what is humor? How culture-specific is humor? Huh. Well, we all assume that humor is absolutely culture-specific uh, because it's linguistic. Certainly my kind of humor is linguistic. Um, but I have found wherever I go that if I read from my novels, even the funniest bits, people get it. I mean, I had a, I had a, I had a session in, in Jaipur at the beginning of this year, which was perhaps the, one of the best sessions I've ever had in which everything I said, uh, 1,500 people laughed. And they laughed in a way that <laughs> told me they'd got the joke. Um, I sh this, this, this isn't me blowing my own trumpet. Well, it is a bit. But I have no difficulty making, uh, reaching across from a, as an Englishman to an Indian audience, um, no difference in making my com comedy reach. I have no, when I'm talking Germany, I feel Germans, contrary to what, what the English like to say about a German sense of humor, the Germans get my jokes immediately, almost before I've made them. The Italians are fantastic. So I think there's a, there is actually something about humor that, that, that goes absolutely anywhere. People get it. And it doesn't have to be physical. And sometimes I feel people don't always know what I'm saying, but they can tell from the heat with which I say it, or from my gesticulations, or from the combi combination of me and what I look like, and my passion for what I'm reading, and the words themselves, they get it. So I feel humor is absolutely international. Like you said during your conversation with uh, Kartika, to laugh you have to be able to get the joke. So I guess that's what you're getting yeah. at. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you can Wonderful. make people get the joke. I like making people get the joke. It's as if Absolutely. I'm in front of an audience and I'm shaking and I'm saying, you will get this joke. And they do. Yes. 
<laughs> awesome. So we've got <laughs> another question. Um, the second question is from Arman Kapoor. Your way of perceiving the world is singular, full of wit and pathos. Have you been like this from an early age or does it come from later experiences or interactions? Huh. That's a good question. I think I was like this from an early age. I always wanted to be a writer, always. I don't remember wanting to be anything else. I used to joke with my mother that the minute I was born, within the first few days, I was looking around me and making a little story about it. My mother would go, that's nonsense, that's silly, don't be ridiculous. But I felt, I felt that way. And um, it took me a long time to write, however. I was in my late 30s before I finally wrote a novel. But that's another story. But I felt I wanted to write and could write, yes, from the earliest stage, always. Um, and then, of course, you know, your experience helps. I couldn't have written Live a Little as a seven-year-old boy. Of course I couldn't. But I could write clever and funny sentences when I was a little boy and, more importantly, wanted to. It's very much about where your, your choice of mode of expression. I knew I didn't want to kick a football around. I knew I didn't want to do lots of the things that other boys did. I just wanted to write, make people laugh. And I suppose selfishly, really, um, because all writers do feel there's something special or odd or, stra or singular. Your question, question, you use the word singular. You feel there's something, you do feel there's something singular in, in you and you want to get it out. You want it expressed. And that's a very early ambition. Lovely. I hope that answers your question, Arman. All right. Our next question is from Shifali Balsari Shah. She's asking, what challenges did you face in Shylock is my name in creating your cerebral Shylock while using the so-called comic elements of Shakespeare's The Merchant of Venice? <laughs> Good question too. I haven't got long enough to answer that. The main challenge I faced was writing, was writing about something that Shakespeare had written. I mean, that's kind of madness. You don't go near Shakespeare. Uh, I, I said to Kartik, I don't heroize people and the only person I ever heroized was my teacher F.R. Levis. It's not quite true. There is Shakespeare. Shakespeare is beyond imagining. Uh, it has a genius beyond imagining. To even go near Shakespeare's words made me made me tremble um, and I thought I shouldn't do it. I thought I shouldn't do it. I, I read a lot around the subject. I thought maybe I could find a way in. And then slowly it occurred to me what I could do was I could act here as a kind of manservant to Shakespeare, a kind of, you know, in all Shakespeare's, so many Shakespeare's plays, there is a fool, the feste or Lear's fool. I could be kind of Shakespeare's fool and I could bring a kind of <laughs> ironic comedy to bear to help him out in one way and the only way he needed helping out was with ignorant audiences because it seemed to me that people didn't understand the play and it seemed to me that people were wrong to think that this was an anti-semitic play it is not an anti-semitic play so i wanted to help out as a kind of assistant attendant gesture to show why where shylock in fact is in many ways sympathetic but have been apart from that why, why Shakespeare um, understood things about Shylock in ways that and evoked Shylock and created Shylock in ways that made it impossible ever to talk about this as, a, as an anti-Semitic play. So that was the way I got there as a kind of, I was Shakespeare's fool. Maybe, I could, maybe they'll have that on my tombstone when I die. He lies Howard Jacobson, he was Shakespeare's fool. That's wonderful. That's a different perspective on, on Shylock for sure. Uh, thank you, Mr. Jacobson. Uh, I have a couple of more questions for you and we do have some time left. Uh, the next question is from Shirin Mehta. In today's world of tweeting, messaging on phones, casual abbreviations, is conversation under threat? Uh, this is dangerous for me because I become uh, a boring old man because I hate all that stuff. Uh, I am kind of I'm technological up to a degree. I have computers, I have a phone, I kind of do all those things, but I don't do any social media. I hate social media, I don't do any. I, I hate it. Um, I think it is bad for us. I think apart from just look at the politics of social media, look at our world at the moment and what people are believing, the nonsense that people are believing. Um, 
and this this is part of the question that you're asking i think it's not only are people not talking as well as they once did because they're just reading stuff online and and sending abbreviated don't mind the abbreviated don't mind the abbreviated symbols but i mind the abbreviated thoughts people because people are not having conversations and correcting and listening to one another apart from the damage that that does to the so called spoke, spoken word our our patience uh, reading books the time that we're prepared to give to a book our expectations of the language of a book apart from that it is feeding all conspiracy theories and things because we can't talk things out with one another we can't say just a moment do you not see how nonsensical that do you not see what nonsense it is to believe what you're believing here what's your evidence show me that we can't do that anymore people just people just and people talk to one another i think if this if our civilization dies um, and we're often told it might die because of climate and so on i think the thing that might just to had a cheerful note i think the thing that will kill us is social media oh, absolutely <laughs> that's wonderful mm. uh, the next question is uh, from damyanti ponappa you didn't believe in the wise lover what according to you is the ideal nature of love i didn't believe in the what lover the wise lover the wise lover i don't know what that means i didn't believe in the wise lover who's the wise lover probably your character that you really? didn't want or i don't recognize that um but what's the next part of the question what's wh what according to you is the ideal nature of love it changes according to how old you are and what i think makes for love now is of course not what i thought made for love when i was 10 i always wanted to be in love i wanted to be in love when i was a very little boy i wanted to be in love i would go on holiday with my parents age 7 or 8 and and i was miserable the whole time and they'd say what's the matter with you what and they'd give me an ice cream or they'd buy me a hamburger or something cuz they'd think that's what i was missing and i couldn't tell them no what i'm missing i want a girlfriend i want a little girlfriend <laughs> I don't want I an want, ice cream. I, I want I don't want an ice cream. <laughs> the ice cream was just so melted away. So I have to put an ice cream and say thank you very much. And all along I longed for a little I longed for a little girlfriend. I want oh. to, I mean I'd love the company of women. I need the company of 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 a woman. I can't survive without it and I'm very lucky to have the company of a woman with whom I talk and talk and talk and talk now. But I always wanted talk, but of course talk becomes more important. Partly because you've got more to talk about. when you're when you're 15 or 16 and you're in love as i remember it it's a, it's a long time ago but as i remember it there there are other things you want to get around to before the conversation conversation is kind of a, a means to an end uh, and slowly but surely as you age you realize no conversation isn't a means to an end conversation is the end and all the other stuff is a means to an end and and uh, there's no point telling anybody of 15 or 16 that you know get rid get all the other stuff out of the way then get on with what it's really about and talk <laughs> talk to one another and don't do it on social media talk to one another there's no way we'll ever be able to persuade the young of that but let me just tell them um to the young who might be sick in love or unhappy or anything like that it gets better it gets better unless you're unlucky enough to find yourself alone if you're not alone make sure you're with somebody you like make sure you're with somebody you enjoy talking to that's the, because that's the most important thing and then just talk just talk and talk and talk until the light fades lovely absolutely wonderful i mean i can relate to that for sure we have one more question mr jacobson and uh, karthik after that i'm going to hand it over to you we do have time okay. so there's no time crunch now okay. um the last question is uh, from mr sumit guha you have said that art for all its adventurousness is also capable of being recidivist what do you mean <laughs> i wish i knew <laughs> <laughs> i wish i knew i don't know what i mean it sounds sounds quite good um i i need to know the circumstances in which i said it um i suppose i'm what did i mean 
I suppose I am I'm very much an art person. I believe that art is everything. I believe that we are never better than when we are than when we make art. Um, and the nearest we can get to being the best we are when we make art is being the best we are when we receive art. We're never better than when we're writing or painting or making music. Um, or second to that, a close second to that, is reading, staring at a painting, or listening to listening to good, listening to good, good music. Um, I think that's when we escape what we are as um, mere human beings, mere human beings, um, because we human beings who simply have thoughts and expressions and um, talk about the beliefs. The great thing about art is it helps us escape from our beliefs. Our beliefs are rubbish. Most of what we believe and called our convictions politically or sociologically are rubbish, just rubbish and at the top of our heads. And we escape all that when we, in the act of making art, we become somebody else. People often say, you know, I go to, I painted or I wrote to find myself. I don't like that one. I like that you paint or make art to lose yourself. And I think you should read to lose yourself, not to be me. Oh, look, I found my, never mind finding yourself in a book. It's nice to find yourself in a book. But the best thing that can happen when you read a great novel is you lose yourself and you become another and you know what it's like to be another. Um, which answers the third part of that question. But what the recidivism means, I don't know. Um, except that might be, no, I don't know. I'm not going to guess. But could you please tell that question, question, person who asked that question mm -hmm. but finally I've been asked a question quoting me with words I don't understand he's a first <laughs> I would buy him a drink Sumit I hope you heard that <laughs> wherever you are thank you uh, Mr. Jacobson that was so lovely and I truly enjoyed that round of questions I hope our audience members uh, got all their answers Kartika I'd like to hand it over back to you now thank you Gillian thank you thank you Gillian um, so when you talked about women, I just want to come back to that uh, that lovely bit in Zoo Time where you where you have the writer wanting to write about uh, his mother-in-law and uh, having a relationship with her. Uh, older women, women around you, mothers, friends, uh, where are the transgressions? Where do you see the transgressions, and how do you go around them? Um, well. Zoo time, and I'm glad you liked zoo time because not everybody was clever enough to get zoo time. So I'm really glad. I'm, I rarely talk about it now, so it's a pleasure to hear you mention it at all, let alone mention it with enthusiasm. So I thank you, Kartika, for that. But the transgression is there in that book. I mean, he really thinks, he really likes the idea of having an affair with his mother-in-law. And I'd say yeah. that's probably a transgression. I think it's I think it's fine to admire your mother-in-law. I've been very lucky. I've had some nice mothers-in-law. Very much. Sometimes I much preferred the mother-in-law to the wife. Actually, um, and that's not recent. Recently, my 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 late my last my final late mother-in-law was was lovely. Um, but I never wanted to have an affair with her, and I wouldn't have had an affair with her. So there's the transgression. You've got to know. But I've enjoyed writing about heroes who are mad enough. To think they might and the hero of if you can call him that of Zutam actually thinks he might have an affair with the mother-in-law and thinks he's received signals from her his male vanity is so preened and crazed that he really thinks she wants an affair with him um, uh, and she doesn't or at least he comes to realize that she probably doesn't but that's the transgression but you it is important in literature the, 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 the great one of the great things about about literature is it takes you to places you don't go to in life and probably shouldn't go to in life. So had he had an affair with the mother in law, well, it might have been an interesting thing to talk about. Um, you can do that. You can do that in art. You can go places in art. After all, the classical myths are full of the most terrible things. You're not yeah. you're not mm -hmm. meant to, you know do the sorts of things that those gods and goddesses did with human beings or those human beings did with, you know, their their pets, if you can quite call them pets. But in literature, you can do those things, which is the point of it. In literature, you can go where you daren't go in life. And therefore, you don't judge characters in literature for, for being wrong. You don't say that was Jupiter. That was a really wrong thing you did. You don't you don't do that. Um, and that's it's that's its joy. But that but the fact that you entertain it in art doesn't mean it's not transgressive and indeed some artists would say art has to be transgressive to be art at all 
Yeah. Um, I know that we will soon run out of time, so I do want you to talk to us a little bit about two things that clearly run across your writing. Uh, one is poetry. You did mention it, and you did it a little bit. But your point, the poetry you quote, the poetry that you uh, make part of your plots and your characters across, across, including your column, uh, for many years, and I think many pieces use poetry uh, in between. Uh, how, what is your relationship with poetry, as opposed to the novel, as opposed to the columns you write? What is that? Is that an intimacy that you've not actually engaged with as a writer? and only as a reader, or is it something that you also do and we have not found it yet? No, it's not something I want to do. I don't know why. It's not something I feel I can do, but, uh, and I always wanted to be a novelist. That was that, a novelist, not anything else. But I received poetry at a very early age from my mother, uh, who used to read. She, my mother was a non-educated woman. She left school when she was 14. Um, she didn't have an educated, was not educated at all, neither of my parents was but she loved poetry and she used to read to me from things like paul graves golden treasury sort of oh my favorite victorian oh. Ge yeah victorian and georgian anthologies um and i've right. still got books somewhere and i would sit at her feet and she would read to me things like um um the scholar gypsy by matthew arnold and um the forsaken merman i love those i love the forsaken mm. merman I was the mer I was the merman that, that you know that fell in love with a with a with a mortal woman and then the mortal woman left me. The Lady of Shalott. I loved the Lady of Shalott. Yeah. My mother would read these things to me with feeling, and I grew to love the sound of poetry and the melancholy of poetry as a as a boy. And then when I went to university, I studied and my first, with Lewis. I studied. I probably spent more time reading poems than I did novels. Um, and as a teacher, I've taught, I've taught a lot of poetry. I've taught Wordsworth and I've taught Coleridge and I've taught Keats and I've taught John Donne um, and Thomas Hardy. For a little while, I lived in the middle of my life. I lived in Cornwall in Thomas Hardy country where Thomas right. Hardy came to the very village where Thomas Hardy came, met his wife, took her away, married her. Um, years later, when she died and he's a man of 80, with deep regret, returns to that part of Cornwall. Following her ghost, woman much missed how you called to me, called to me, saying that now you are not as you were when you had changed from the one who was all to me, wandering the cliff. And I wandered those cliffs, um, kind of in his footsteps in a way. My second novel, Peeping Tom, is about Thomas Hardy, is about somebody who thinks he is a kind of reincarnation of Thomas Hardy. And that gave me an opportunity to write about where I was living at the time in a place that's saturated with Thomas Hardy's poems. I couldn't walk onto those cliffs in this village of Boscastle where I was living and look at the sea and not hear Hardy talking about the opal and the sapphire of that wandering, the opal and the sapphire of that wandering western sea. It was just, I, my, I, I, my ears were, were full of that. And that's one of the greatest sequence of poems ever written, Thomas Hardy's poems. It, poems of remorse about how guilty he felt mm. that he'd neglected, been unfaithful to, forgotten his wife, and then after her death, he goes in pursuit of her again. It suited my melon. It suited very much suited. These poems suited my melancholy nature, as with words with two of those poems of poems of regret. Where I right. what I had to regret as a young man, I don't know. But I was full of regret before I had anything to regret. And poetry is, you know, the most wonderful mode of expression for expressing mm. that regret. The words with Lucy poems. Yeah. Yeah. That, one of my the greatest poems ever written, I think, is that moment when short poem sonnet is it, when Wordsworth turns to 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 um, share a moment of pleasure with somebody, only to realise that that person isn't there, that she's dying, surprised by joy, impatient as the wind. I turn to share the transport, oh, with whom but thee, deep buried in the silent tomb. That fantastic sense of. You, uh, where you love somebody so much that you think they're still alive and you need them to be still alive to share something with. And then when you realize they're not alive, you castigate yourself. It's a wonderful poem of regret and guilt. Castigate yourself for not thinking every moment of the day that that person has left, for not being in sorrow every moment of the day. How could I forget thee? 
even uh, I won't go on reading the poem, but that's what that that's what the poetry speaks to um, in me. A slightly different side. It's not the comic side. The non-comic yeah. side is what poetry speaks to. When you refer a lot to the Brontes as well, and I, I don't, I realize no too many male writers who hark back to Jane Austen and the Bronte territory of and the landscape as much as you do. You do a lot of that, so it felt somewhere that you are a lot more in touch with that uh, older women or younger women, but their their lives, their romanticism, the way they read text as well. Something about the way you write seems to suggest a uh, bigger than male gaze and a, and a more expansive than the usual masculinity that one encounters in male writers. That really kept me going through all the writing of yours that I was reading. Um, but I want to ask you one more question that's about publishing. You have published with, a, well, with some of the major publishers in the world. And then when you do write about the way uh, publishing has changed agencies and uh, there's this wonderful scene where an agent is almost dreading the fact that a writer has finished a manuscript because oh, well, now she has to place it and has to find a publisher for it and really who's reading literary fiction. Is that how you feel? Is this a really, like have we come to the end of literary fiction? You say you've come to the end of not literary fiction, but the modern reader who's turning away from literary fiction, I think you said that somewhere. But it's a very scary space where I sit, where I watch people reading less and less challenging writing. Do you see that as a writer or is there hope? Well, there's always hope, but I do think there are problems at the moment. And um, this is, I won't, I, won't, I won't give you the details, but this is a tricky moment with me and me and publishers right this minute. Um, and that me and the whole literary world, I don't like the tone of the literary world at the moment. Um, I think we're, we're, we're about to move into a phase of being censored. Um, I've just been, I feel I am being censored right this minute. Actually, I don't mean by you, but in what I'm writing. Um, I see my publishers getting all excited about things like diversity which is a wonderful thing in the, you know, diverse voices. How could I not welcome that as a Jewish writer? And Jewish writers haven't had a big voice in my country, I might in America, but they haven't had a big voice in my, so I welcome that. But when publishers go out looking for diversity or think that diversity is a literary value, it makes me very annoyed. Um, I, I think there is a kind of, if you're not careful, you end up sounding like, Donald Trump or something, but I think there is a right onness in the publishing world at the moment. I think publishers are falling over backwards not to cause offence, and if you're worried about causing offence, you shouldn't have anything to do with writers, because that's what writers do. That's like managing a comedy club and saying, but I don't want you to say anything that will upset anybody to the, to the comedians that you hire. Don't run a managing, don't run a club in that case. And I think publishers are running scared. I think this is known. I'm not the only person saying that. Publishers are frightened of what their writers are going to say. They're frightened of what they're going to publish. And they have to be seen to be correct. And I don't think that this is good for literature or for publishing or for the future of either. Okay. Okay. That, that leads into a very big conversation, I guess. And we don't have time to go there. Yes. So I get to ask my last yes. question and then I think we wind up. But I do want to ask you this. You pay a lot of attention to naming your characters, and you've talked about this as well. Um, and you talked about Sefton and how you, what the name came to mean to you as you wrote it, etc. I just want to ask you, going by the way you think about yourself, and if you had the choice and you were going to be able to name yourself, what would you call yourself? What would I call myself? Yes. What does that name of the character that is you that would just fit you and that you would be happy you said it has to be redolent of all these things that the character is what's your name in that world it'd have to be an old testament prophet like who uh, who's the one i've forgotten the name now you see i'm like beryl i've forgotten the name who's the one that foretells doom to everybody um well, Cassandra could have been Cassandra. I wouldn't mind Cassandra, though that's a woman's name. But there you are, as you've yes, said, absolutely. there is a lot of there is a lot of woman in me. Yes, Cassandra. <laughs> um, I forgot. I f Jeremiah. Jeremiah. Okay. Jeremiah. You are. Jeremiah. <laughs> Cass Jeremiah. Cassandra. Jacobs. There yeah. you go. I 
loved having a conversation with you. I'm so glad I got to do it. Thank you, Tata Lit Live, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Jacobson. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Carter. Thank you very much indeed. I've thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. Thank you for talking Thank to you. me. Real pleasure. Thank you. Over to you, Gillian. Thank you so much, Mr. Jacobson and Kartika, for this extremely engaging conversation. It's been a pleasure having you.